You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan. This is Episode 61, covering the week of February 27th through March 3rd, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Always the housekeeping before we get started. Uh, If you uh, have not done so, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and like our YouTube page. Also remember that the Abbeville Institute exists on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, this podcast, the website, our programs, anything that we put on, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. It does help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, and we have a variety of different membership levels. You can uh, donate as little as $3 a month if you're a student. Uh, or you can make an annual donation, or we also have business and uh, uh, contributions as well. So all of that information is available on our website, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you see there's a uh, button or at least a tab for support, and under that you have memberships for individuals, you have endowment giving, you have memberships for businesses, and all of our different levels are contained within that particular tab. So please go on out there and check that out. Also, if you want to sign up for our email list, you can do so through our Facebook page or you can go to our webpage and do that as well. And you will get our Daily Dose of Dixie and our weekly email. Plus, you also get, uh, if you sign up through our webpage, a free ebook, uh, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell. Uh, so you can pick that up as well for free. So it's highly worth it. You got a lot of good stuff out there. And of course, the website itself is a treasure trove of uh, material on the South, the Southern tradition, be it the Southern cultural tradition, Southern political tradition, what have you. Uh, We have a lot of material out there. We have some primary material at the James McClellan Library dealing with uh, the issue of secession and nullification uh, and the original Constitution. And we have the Clyde Wilson Library, which contains a number of articles that he's written over the year. Of course, he's written over 600 articles. Some of those now are being published through the blog and the review, but Uh, There are a number of articles there. And, of course, our uh, five-day-a-week material on the website through the blog and the review on a variety of topics. And that's what we cover every day here on the podcast. And if you're just listening to this podcast for the first time, you can go out and uh, go to iTunes and uh, get it, subscribe to it there. Uh, We do have that available for you. So uh, please do all of those things and share our podcast and our material on social media. It is one way we will expand our reach and help other people explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition because that is the thing that we do best. Okay, so let's talk about the week in review. What do we, what do, we do this week? Well, we had a lot of interesting material, I think, and uh, the general theme was Yankees. Uh, and the... Uh, as Clyde Wilson wrote in the Thursday piece, New England against America. So uh, I think Susan Mary Grant, uh, Susan Mary Grant's book, North, uh, North Over South, uh, had it best. You know, what happened after the war is that you had a northern view of American history take hold of America. And that had not always been certain that that would happen. I think you can go back and look at American history, particularly the first 80 years of American history under the Constitution, and then uh, not just that, uh, the time before that, and understand that the South was definitely the dominant section in uh, in America. Uh, it was the dominant section once you had the Constitution. It was the dominant section before that, of course. You know, a Southerner, Thomas Jefferson, wrote, the Declaration of Independence. It was Virginia that proposed that we would have independence. And so even though Massachusetts was seen as this uh, kind of uh, you know, rabble-rousing section that helped lead to independence, it was the South that was so important in this process. And we talked about that last week and how important the South was in the, in the American War for Independence. And of course, you know, George Washington being a Southerner and James Madison and James Monroe, uh, Andrew Jackson, James K. Polk, all of these people that uh, were Southerners, you know, Zachary Taylor, William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, all of these people were, were Southern by birth. And so it's important to note that how, how, how powerful the South was in this antebellum period, and it was only through the war that really transformed the way we think about America, and we started thinking about America as a Northern-dominated place. I mean, you have 
uh, the New England Patriots nowadays, the football team. Everyone thinks the American War for Independence. Well, that's that's in the North. The South had nothing to do with that. Of course, we know that the South, if it wasn't for the South, the, the uh, United States would not have gained their independence. And so it's this northern view of American history that has become you know, dominant. And that's unfortunate because uh, people lose a connection with what America really is through that interpretation. And so what we've done this week is talk about a variety of different topics, did a lot with literature because I think that's, um, that's important. Uh, but uh, the first piece was written by yours truly, Let the Bear Flag Go. Now this piece was actually published at townhall.com. Uh, before we ran it on our website uh, a couple of weeks ago. But it's about the idea of California secession. And I say this is a good thing. California should go. Number one, the issue with California secession, when you start looking at it objectively, and I think there is an emotional response from a lot of people to this, particularly neoconservatives who have this uh, this, uh, almost strange uh, fascination with calling everything neoconfederate, uh, you know, Victor Davis Hanson, I, this was a response to a piece Victor Davis Hanson had wrote, uh, had written that said, uh, you know, California goes neo-Confederate or something along those lines. And so what I point out is that, look, uh, the idea of secession was not necessarily just a Southern idea. Uh, you look at, I guess you're ignoring the history of the United States when you talk about uh, that being a neo-Confederate ideology because uh, the United States would not be here without secession. It was the, the act of, of uh, declaring their independence as an act of secession. And I know some people like to split hairs and say, no, 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 secession and independence are two different things. They're not. It's a group of people deciding in popular conventions that they want to leave the Union. And this had been discussed many times in the North prior to it actually happening in the South. In fact, the first group of people to talk about it were Northerners. In 1794, you had Oliver Ellsworth and Rufus King, both members of the uh, Philadelphia Convention, pull aside John Taylor of Caroline and say, hey, look, John, this thing isn't working. We, we want out. And so uh, they, King and Ellsworth, Ellsworth from uh, Connecticut, King uh, from Massachusetts, but that at that point was serving from New York. Uh, and so, and that's actually an interesting issue. You had a uh, a Yankee from Massachusetts moving into New York, and we'll talk about that in the piece on Thursday. And so you had this um, this push beginning then that, hey, this union isn't working. New England is being marginalized. The South is dominating this government. We need out. Uh, and so it was Northerners who started this process first, not Southerners. But most Americans don't think about that. They think secession is just simply a, quote-unquote, as Victor Davis Hanson says, neo-Confederate idea. Well, I guess, I mean, if you consider the, the uh, that's not a, I mean, that, that pejorative neo-Confederate is just so silly. For one reason in particular, uh, the original United States, the idea of a federal republic or a Confederate republic, it, it carries the same meaning. In fact, Everyone in the United States, if you believe in federalism, is a quote-unquote neo-Confederate. But it shows you that a lot of these people on the right and the left, they're not interested in federalism. What they're interested in is nationalism. And uh, American nationalism has been problematic throughout American history because these one-size-fits-all approaches to things just don't work. Uh, So I I also mentioned, you know, early uh, colonial history... um, and how the opposition to the Stamp Act was actually nullification. The Suffolk Resolves, which came out of Massachusetts, was actually nullification. Uh, the Constitution um, uh, was basically a secession from the Articles. Uh, so it's just it's it's silly to think that this is somehow a quote unquote neo Confederate idea that came out of uh, the South in 1860 and 61, uh, when abolitionists were were promoting secession all the way up until the 1850s, even some abolitionists into the war. You know, people like Lysander Spooner were saying, look, let the South go. I mean, we, we won. We didn't want slaveholders in our republic. Now they're gone, so let them go. Uh, and, of course, secession is really just self-determination. But the point about this and talking about the North, you have these people in California that think that they're different. 
They believe that they are different. They believe that uh, their culture is different. And so they want out. And in fact, the only reason that uh, Hillary Clinton had more popular votes in the last election is because of California. And I think the question that every American has to ask themselves, at least particularly those who call themselves conservative, is do we want California running the union? Because if we just think, simply look at popular votes, that's what would happen. We would have the United States government run by California. And do we want that? Do we want California values becoming American values? Now, I think you could say that some of this has happened. But is that what, what Americans really want? Americans in North Dakota or uh, Illinois, uh, southern Illinois in particular, Americans in the south. Even some Americans in California don't want uh, the United States to be run by California. But maybe if California seceded, we could get those people out and they could come live in real America. Um, so this question of secession, I think, is something that people have to ask themselves. Um, you know, would this make for a better union, ultimately, to have some states that don't get along? Wouldn't it be better to have a, a peaceful divorce rather than forced, a forced marriage? Why would we do that? Uh, as I say, a divorce of incompatible things is preferable to an abusive marriage. And essentially, that's what you have with American nationalism. One side or the other is going to be abused. Whether it's if, if California is running the union, then those on uh, those in red state America are going to be abused. If uh, if red state America is running a union, that then those in California think they're going to be abused. And actually, I mean, you're seeing this more and more as be uh, becoming popular. You know, Pat Buchanan wrote a piece essentially along the same lines. Uh, you know, several days after I'd written this one, but um, you know, maybe we need to just say uh, adios. We're 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 done with this. Uh, why would we try to force people into one union or another? So I think, uh, as, as Dr. Livingston has pointed out, you know, decentralization is going to be the idea of the 21st century, and more and more young people are coming around to this idea. Uh, what we need is less centralization, more decentralization, more self-determination. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is not something that is going to uh, produce violence and bloodshed. That's also another fallacy of logic. You know, I mentioned Victor Davis Hanson's uh, fallacy in logic in this particular piece. And his logic goes something like this. Some Californians who don't like Trump want to secede. Thirteen southern states who didn't like Abraham Lincoln seceded and formed the Confederate states. I, don't, I think the Confederacy was bad. California secession is bad. It's a... It's a terrible fallacy of logic. It doesn't even work together. Also, this idea that there is a... Uh, there are only two choices. You know, if if you have secession, uh, then you have war. If you don't have secession, you don't have war. Again, that's a fallacy in logic. You're, you're you're not letting someone choose it. Is there another is there another way? Does secession have to be violent? No, it doesn't. Uh, if enough people say, look, I mean, this is what the people of California want, and if enough people start believing that in self determination, then California can go in peace. It doesn't have to be war, and I think the saying that it, it has to be is a major problem, uh, and it's been created by this uh, north over south mentality that Susan Mary Grant talked about. Okay, so with that out of the way, I mean, we have this idea that you know, California can go if we just all started believing in self-determination. It doesn't have to lead to war. It just, this is better for us. If they're gone, we don't have to, we don't have to bicker with each other anymore. There's no more Nancy Pelosi or Maxine Waters or uh, you know, for a long time, Barbara Boxer. These people can go and get the heck out of here, and we don't have to see them again. All right, so <clears throat> on uh, Tuesday, we published a piece by uh, Jim Kibler, Era of the South's Ear, and it was a review of a book uh, by George Garrett, the late George Garrett, who was a fantastic uh, literary critic, uh, philosopher, uh, and um, the, the bilk is My Silk Purse and Yours, The Publishing Scene in American Literary Art. And the interesting thing about this review, this was actually published in 1993. The book was, came out in 1992. So this is an older review. So it's 20 years old now. Uh, and Garrett died, I think, in 2008. Uh, so the interesting thing about this, first of all, the picture is marvelous of uh, Garrett sitting at his desk. Uh, he's got a little battle flag in the background. And um, uh, you know that, that would not fly today at a, at a college uh, or university setting. But... <clears throat> What this proves is that there is 
a northern bias even in publishing. And, and uh, Clyde Wilson's piece on Thursday gets into the exact same thing. There is a northern bias in literary publishing, and it creates an artificial aristocracy. It creates an artificial literary aristocracy. It basically says all these northern writers are great because they're promoted and they're published, and all these southern writers are no one or nobodies. And so Garrett is, is attacking that, and I think doing quite a good job of that in, the, in his collection of essays uh, that uh, Kibler is uh, reviewing. Uh, and he talks about this, uh, this artificial fashion of, you know, well, we've got these, uh, you know, respectable uh, uh, northern writers, and uh, these are the only people uh, who are worthy of reading. And this was a problem in the antebellum period. And, and so I'm going to kind of put these two, this piece together with, with Clyde's uh, New England Against America. This is the same thing that happened with, with uh, William Gilmore Sims. Sims was eventually blacklisted in the North because of his anti-Uncle Tom's, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, pieces. And um, that's unfortunate because Sims, uh, being forgotten to time, uh, was such an important part of the Southern cultural fabric. Uh, his his books on uh, the American War for Independence in the South are just fantastic, and nobody knows anything about William Gilmore Sims. If you take an American liter uh, literature course, you're going to read mostly about uh, Northern writers. You're going to read Whitman, and you're going to read uh, Hawthorne, which is good, uh, but uh, you're going to read a lot of other fluff that uh, is not very good. Uh, you know, Longfellow and... Uh, uh, people like that. So uh, it's it's uh, important to understand where this came from. Well, it came from the fact that New York and New England dominated the literary circles, and they essentially blocked out the South. And so they didn't, because they didn't like the South, they didn't think the South had anything worthy of reading, uh, you had the New Englandification of American literature, or the Yankification of American literature. Uh and uh, Garrett calls it the Poetry Mafia, which is fantastic. Uh, and, of course, uh, Garrett was on to something, in, uh, and he talked about he, uh, This is what Kibler says, quote, Garrett is highly critical of the self-promoting, self-marketing star system that denies the many humble, genuine writers not deemed stars by the establishment, but who still survive the school of hard knocks and the great shrugs of indifference, even rejection. Um, and so Garrett writes about these Southern writers who can't make it because they're not the stars. And you have that. You I mean, go out and look today. Who's being promoted? Uh, you get in with a publisher, and they promote the tar out of your work, and that's how you, uh, that's how you make it big. Now, I think some of that is changing. This essay is 20 years old, and if you can hustle yourself because of the internet, you can break this cycle, and I think the the publishers are realizing this. You have people that have never had any type of help from a big publishing house become New York Times bestsellers because they know how to work the internet and they know how to hustle themselves. Uh, you have a, a nice you know example of this are um, uh, mom blogs, right? These these women that go out and they have blogs on the internet and uh, they get followers. And then they do promotional pieces themselves and promotional work, and they become New York Times bestsellers almost overnight because of their following on the Internet, not because they had any big marketing house go out there and say, this person's important, you should read them, uh, but because they did it themselves. And so creating a following now online is so much easier than it's ever been before. You don't need a publishing house putting your books in Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble is losing you know, uh, market share. Uh, Amazon has taken them, and now if you go into Barnes and Noble, it's uh, it's all toy store, half the store, and plus you have the the uh, disappearance of mom and pop bookstores. So getting in your bookstores, getting in your brick and mortar does help, without a doubt. I mean, being being seen there helps, but if you can go out and get a following and work it the right way online, you don't need that, and you become you can become a New York Times bestseller. So. The monopoly that New York publishing houses have had on publishing is being broken all the time. A nice example of that, too, is Shotwell Press, which is Clyde Wilson's press. Uh, and he's got all these marvelous little books. It's essentially a self-publishing self house, but 
uh, he's got the books for the right price. A lot of them are under ten bucks, and uh, they've got uh, you know online marketing. You go on their website, you get a free ebook just like we do. Uh, that you get uh, one of Clyde's books, and uh, it, it's it's great. It's Shotwell Press, S H O T W E L L Press, or Shotwell Publishing, and um, you just look them up online, and they've got a, a series of marvelous books. So this is where uh, you know someone like uh, George Garrett was was speaking of something that was happening in the '90s that really the internet has started to break, though it's still nice to get published with a major publisher because they can help you uh, become very popular. Uh, as uh, uh, as Garrett says, you know, this is one of his quotes, quote, Fred, by dint of hard labor and unmistak- unmistakable achievement alone without any boot or apple polishing, politicking or hustling or swaggering self-aggrandizement, has cracked the toughest and most definitive elite in the American literary scene, the poetry mafia. I am not fixing here to names, to name any names. They are mostly Yankees uh, and... Uh, that's what they are. I mean, this is uh, so he's calling these people out. Uh, you know, he's talking about Fred Chapel. Um, of course, saying that, not, not fixing here to name any names, and just by saying that is showing who who, uh, who George Garrett was. I mean, he's he's definitely Southern to the core. Uh, so uh, Garrett was pointing out a problem in the American publishing scene. That has since been rectified by the Internet. This is one thing where I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast where you can help us. The Internet is the great leveler. It really is. This podcast, I mean, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have had this. Now I can just go on uh, for the Abbeville Institute and record this podcast, put it out there, and hundreds if not thousands of people can get it. I'd like to see tens of thousands of people. That does take a little effort. It takes some takes you uh, getting out there and telling your friends about this podcast. But um, it's important that we do that. Uh, and so breaking the New York monopoly on, or Yankee monopoly, on what is respectable literature, what is respectable history, what is respectable culture, that's important. And so, uh, you know, keep that in mind. So this piece by Clyde Wilson, New, New England Against America, points out that, you know, again, you had uh, uh, great uh, great writers in the South that are ignored, and he focuses most of his attention here on William Gilmore Sims. And uh, this piece is also older. It was written in 1989. Uh, so now we're looking at almost 30 years ago. But um, nothing has changed. Uh, you still go to your American literature courses. Now, I, I'm happy to say that that's not the case in every American literature course. But if you get your typical standard American literature textbook, you might have a short story by uh, William Faulkner, which is um, going to going to be probably a rose for Emily. Uh, you might have uh, maybe uh, maybe some Flannery O'Connor, which is fine. Uh, you definitely are going to have some Poe, which of course he was a Southern writer, but nobody nobody accuses him of being that. He's just an American writer. This is what New England does. They're ingenious in this. Well, that person's an American writer, not not a Southern writer. Uh, but of course, that's that's just so incorrect. And so Clyde gets into the fact that you know this New England stuff isn't even as good as Southern writing. Uh, and of course he says, you know, I know people are going to disagree with that, uh, but um, it's it's important to to bring these people out. If you could just have William, a, a piece by William Gilmore Sims in a uh, anthology of American literature, that would be a, an amazing accomplishment. So the more of us that can go out. And say, you know, let's read, uh, let's read William Gilmore Sims. Uh, let's read Henry Timrod. Uh, you know, it, that would be that would go a long way to changing the perspective in American literature and making it really more American, not just New England. So, breaking that New England monopoly on that Yankee monopoly on publishing, and then breaking the Yankee monopoly on what constitutes good literature. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're a, a student of literature or you're maybe a, a graduate student going into American literature, and we have a lot of those people affiliated with the Institute, think about that. Your job could be changing the way we think about uh, American literature moving forward and bringing people like uh, William Gilmore Sims out of the shadows. Uh, I was just sent a, an article from a student. I think it was at uh, I can't remember where, where the uh, where the student wrote this essay, but it was talking about Henry Timrod and how um, the uh, people ignore the fact that Bob Dylan 
was stealing lyrics in 2006 from Henry Timrod. So here's Bob Dylan, the great bohemian uh, hippie, uh, stealing lyrics from uh, the poet laureate of the Confederacy. And we've talked about all kinds of different literary figures on this particular podcast and on the website, Southern Literary Figures. And so uh, go out there and read these people. Just do a, on our website, just go to a little uh, magnifying glass at the top and just do a search for Southern Literature. And it'll pull up all the different articles we've, we've published on Southern Literature and different Southern literary figures. One of my favorite is Frank Tickner, um, who nobody knows anything about. But Frank Tickner... Um, I was writing some really good poems uh, in the antebellum period, particularly during the war, um, and they were, they were a lot of fun. Um, and so you go out there and read Frank Tickner. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you can do this, if you can find these southern uh, literary figures that are fun to read and, and have been forgotten, it's almost like you know, opening a, a treasure chest. Uh, you know, you're finding buried treasure, and it's so enjoyable to do that because it's something new. It's something unique. Anyone can go out and read Longfellow, for example, or Whitman. But when you find these buried uh, you know, pieces that nobody knows anything about, and then you can bring them to the light, you're really doing the South and, of course, the Southern tradition a service. Okay, uh, the piece on uh, Wednesday was a Pilgrim's, a Pilgrim's Progress, Nathaniel Hawthorne Reconsidered by Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is a professor of uh, English literature uh, at Hillsdale College. And so he wrote... Uh, this piece was uh, published in 1983 again, so a long time ago in Southern Partisan Magazine. And, and um, he wrote a number of pieces very uh, sympathetic to the South. In fact, he went to the University of Georgia. Um, he's uh, been uh, highly uh, productive in writing about the fugitive agrarians. And this particular piece is interesting because he brings out the fact that Hawthorne was a Southern sympathizer. Um, you know, you would think that he's a quintessential Yankee, but he wasn't. Uh, he wrote a biography of Franklin Pierce where he was very critical of Yankees. He didn't like them. Uh, and uh, Hawthorne didn't agree with the war. You had a lot of people like that. Melville didn't agree with the war. Hawthorne didn't agree with the war. And uh, these guys were Democrats, and I think oftentimes it's point, you know, people, oh, they were just Democrats, and they just didn't like Republicans. Uh, maybe it's because they just didn't think that Yankee culture, Puritan culture, was that productive. Uh, in fact, he he was he bashed reformers everywhere he could, and so Hawthorne uh, is uh, actually a, a interesting figure in New England literature, in that he didn't really fit with New England culture, particularly the reformers of the time, and I think that's um, that's important to note that you didn't the North was just not monolithic. I mean, we've talked about this on this podcast. The North wasn't just all Yankees, and they weren't just all in favor of uh, you know, the war. And, uh, you know, when you look at the 1864 election, for example, Lincoln only got 55% of the popular vote. That's a, that's a real strong statement, 45% of the North. And that's considering that there might have been some voter fraud going on or people boycotting the election. Lincoln gets 55%. That's not a crushing majority in 1864. Uh, you would think that if the North was just simply monolithic in favor of the war, he would have gotten 70% of the Northern vote, 80%. He only got 55%. So you had a lot of Northerners who just, just didn't care for Lincoln. And uh, that's what, what uh, you know Jordan's getting into in this piece, that you have Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was highly critical of the Northern uh, war effort and the North in general, uh, and he's from the North. So we need to understand that not every Northerner supported this war. Not every Northerner supported the Yankification of America. They looked at America as um, as a comprehensive place, uh, and they reached across sections. Uh, they admired Southerners for what they were. Uh, you know, you had um, Washington Irving, who um, loved the South. You know, his his estate Sunnyside in New York. I mean, he he hated Yankees. That's what that's what Ichabod Crane is. He's a Yankee. We've, I've mentioned this on this program before. So you, you, you have this uh, different type of northerner who was against all this, this burnt-over district, uh, you know, New England uh, transcendentalism. All of that stuff was just wrong. Uh, and, of course, it created problems for America in general. You know, you look at uh, and it's something that has been brought up in, in politics recently with uh, Barack Obama hanging around in Washington, D.C. now, and he's kind of leading this 
grassroots, uh, you know, uh, fire in the rear movement against the, the Trump administration through the deep state. He had all these appointees go in there, and he is organizing from his home in Washington uh, this opposition. And people are saying, this has never happened. This is unprecedented. Well, sure, it happened before. It happened in 1831 when John Quincy Adams was so bitter after losing the White House, uh, he went out and uh, was elected to Congress and became uh, the same type of thing. He led this. He had this brush fire against the South, and he agitated, and that helped contribute to the war. Uh, you know, John Quincy Adams, the war may not have come as it did without John Quincy Adams. People forget that. You know, and uh, I think that's, uh, you know, one thing Tom Fleming, not the Tom Fleming from Rockford, but the Thomas Fleming, the historian, uh, ha- has done uh, in his most recent book on the war. He pointed out that, you know, abolitionists, reformers, were a problem. Uh, and they helped contribute to the war. In fact, uh, most people didn't like abolitionists because they considered them problematic, uh, because they were they were agitating and, and, and leading to disunion sentiment in the way they were speaking of the South. Southerners were getting very defensive. I mean, you have to look at the war and the coming of the war in that particular way. You had Northerners saying that uh, you know Southerners were devils. They were subhuman. And if that's if that's going to be said about you, you're going to start being very defensive and by being defensive, you're going to start saying, well, look, we'll just leave. If you don't like us, if you think we're devils, we're subhuman, why are we here? Uh, and so a lot of people don't think about that rhetoric going into the war and how that rhetoric was so damaging. And John Quincy Adams was behind it. And so when you look at what Obama's doing, I mean, we could be setting the stage for another very contentious and, and uh, situation in the United States. Um, and so I think that that's important to note. John Quincy Adams is, and Barack Obama is, John Quincy Adams. That's what he's doing. I wouldn't be surprised if Obama or maybe even Michelle Obama ends up running for office somewhere. Again, maybe the Senate, the Congress. Uh, I could see uh, for, uh, particularly Michelle Obama going for a, a Senate run. Uh, they have to get out of D.C., but uh, going to, and running for the Senate and then maybe trying to position themselves for her running for office, just like Hillary Clinton did. I mean, I, I could see this definitely happening. That wouldn't have happened with John Quincy Adams, you know, so, uh, you know, women couldn't uh, be elected back then. But I think nowadays, uh, this is this is what happens. Uh, and I could definitely see that happening with, with the Obamas. Uh, and so this brush fire that they've started um, can, can grow. Um, and I think the, the nicest uh, corollary to that would be John Quincy Adams. So again, it's, it's Yankification of America. Finally, the last piece we had for the week, and we're, we're getting long on time here, but was by uh, John Shelton Reed. It's a very short piece, The Sense of Southernizing. And this actually gets into uh, this idea of, you know, Yankification of things. But this is a Southernification of things, so Southernizing things. And he's talking about hymns and how Southerners would take a New England hymn and they would make it their own. Uh, and this is important. Uh, he he um, he talks about a book George Pullen Jackson's White Spirituals in the Southern Uplands, and uh, he 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 introduces that verb to southernize. Uh, he says uh, Shelton Reed quote says this: Many of the Southern gospel songs he studied had their origins he shows in the North. But when they were reprinted for use in the South, the arrangements were often changed, southernized. Often the publication indicated who did it, southernized by so so and so. And Shelton Reed says, what this meant was that each of the non-melody parts was made more complicated and more interesting. The bass, for instance, instead of droning away on three or four notes as the New England version had him doing, was giving something like a different melody of his own to play around with down under the melody proper. The same was done for the other backup parts. None was entirely subordinate. None was boring. Everyone got to show off sometime. This is actually jazz. That's what jazz is. It's just showing off. And so he's talking about southernizing and how this music, this idea, you know, jazz, uh, blues. You think about jazz and blues music. It's about showing off. It really is. I mean, you know, guitar solos uh, in blues music. Um, you have uh, the solos in jazz music from all of the all of the instruments in the band, the jazz band. You have the clarinet showing off, the trumpet showing off, the trombone showing off. Uh, all of the instruments get to show off, get to take their time and have a good time with it. That's, that's Dixieland jazz. 
And so he's pointing out this was being done in gospel music. So southernizing is so important for American music. Uh, you can't have American, I mean, you had these Yankees producing something that's dry and boring, and Southerners making it much more interesting. You had Yankees producing literature that's dry and boring, or you can have Southern literature, which is much more interesting. Because it, it comes from a real place. Now, you could say Hawthorne was coming from a real place, being very critical of, uh, of New England culture. But Southern literature, Southern music comes from a real place. And that's one thing we have to understand about this idea of independence. You can't have independence without a culture. And California has a culture. It might be a political culture, but it really is a left-wing culture. And uh, that's why they can start talking about independence. You can't have people say, well, we need Southern independence. Well, you look around, and we're losing our culture. The South is losing its culture. You can't have independence without a culture. It's impossible. People have to be wanting to defend something against something else and saying it's important. It's, it's so important to defend this that we want to be independent because it's, it's being uh, you know, ruined, eradicated, whatever the case may be. And so that's why we focus a lot in this particular podcast and or on this podcast and at the website. We focus on Southern culture. Because without Southern culture, you can't have political independence for the South, um, if that's what we really want. So you have to have something that unifies people. And uh, when you look at some of the things that are so good about the South, I and mean, we've talked about food, you know, we've talked about music, we've talked about literature. These things are real. They're tangible things that you can grab onto, hold on to. Um, and it's not just the political culture, which is also important, and this idea of individualism that Shelton Reed talks about. Uh, so I think that uh, overall, when we're looking at what we're trying to do here and exploring what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, this is it. Um, and we've talked about sport, you know, things like NASCAR, and we've talked about, uh, you know, football and baseball. Uh, now, football and baseball are all New England creations. Just, again, New England created them, but the South does them better. So there you go. Um New England was the first to push the session, but the South actually had the backbone to do it. This is often what happens in America. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, particular uh, episode of the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. I will see you next time. Until next time, good day. Good day.